So, hi, Maggie. What the fuck is up? Great. <laughs> I, I, is this how you always start your podcast? Oh, yeah. I, 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 just, I just go and say, what's up, Maggie? And say, my name is Jeff. I don't know what the fuck is up. <laughs> Good to have you in Sofia again. I mean, you, you're here for like two days now and you've basically become naturalized in Bulgaria. I love this place. I came here when I was like, 16 sunny yeah. beach and it was like the cheapest alcohol we just got drunk constantly excellent That's... went to see the venga boys do you know do you remember the venga boys i remember the I'm, i am this old <laughs> so i remember the venga boys so basically Bulgaria is sunny beach to you that's um that's uh disturbing but also lovely in a really <laughs> peculiar way so Maggie, you literally finished an event with us that um, we, had, we had it yesterday about uh, dark energy so you're our dark energy and dark matter lady. How did that happen? I mean, how did you get into into that field and then into astrophysics in general? Honestly, I have loved science since I was really young. I think um, like one of the ma- key memories I remember is just going camping with my dad and just going out and seeing how dark the night sky is with Mm. all the stars and stuff. And I just always knew that I wanted to kind of explore the universe and be an astronaut. That was like my dream. I was going to go to space. Um, And I always loved science experiments. I loved my science teachers. We used to like blow things up all the time, like build model rockets that would either like just get destroyed or or not go very far. Um, I don't know. And as as I learned more and more about it um, in particular, um, so I did an undergraduate degree at the University of Kent in astronomy, space science, and astrophysics. And then I went to do a master's in uh, UCLA, Los Angeles. And my one of my lecturers there taught me cosmology. And it was just the most mind-blowing thing to me, yeah. um, learning that, like, from the skies, we can figure out, like, the whole fate of the universe, like whatever, like predict what's going to happen in the future, know exactly what happens in the past just by Majestic looking at stuff. some stars. Yeah. That's fucking cool. Why did you go with your dad to to see the stars? I mean, why did you find a, a non-light polluted place? In England, actually, there's quite a few places that we mm. have dark sky areas. I can't remember in particular where we, we went all over the place, to be honest. Mm. Um, Peak District and stuff. Um, Devon, you can literally see the Milky Way from Devon. So mm. there are a lot of dark sky places. Um, you need to leave London. Um, because you need you, to leave you, London. Yeah. yeah. That's you, a good there, There's no stars in <laughs> London. Like stars don't exist. Yeah, yeah that's... Uh... <laughs> That's one thing that civilization loses slowly over time with uh, light pollution. Yeah. Well, we lose it anyway with the expansion of the universe, right? Yeah. Well, because light probably can a bit only... more time, though. Like, <laughs> just give it five minutes. We well, will... if you came to my talk yesterday, you yes. would know that if the universe was phantom, it, it, dark energy was phantom dark energy, mm. then the acceleration of our universe is getting faster and faster. Hmm. So it's acceleratingly expanding at the moment, but it could be accelerating at an even faster rate. Hmm. And that means very quickly, we won't be able to see any stars or galaxies at all. Jesus, that's depressing. It's so depressing. But if we stop seeing stars, what do you think the effect on humanity would be? I don't know. Um, I mean, we have like fireworks and stuff. (laughs) Right, so we're gonna make fake stars, is what she's saying. Just build a dome. Honestly, have you seen those drone like light shows? Yeah, they are the most amazing thing. I I could watch them all day. Like, if stars and galaxies didn't exist, yeah, I could just stare at them and be fascinated by them. Make my own. You're gonna trade stars for drones. Yeah, that's so capitalist. Jesus. You'd be the one selling the drones. I'll be selling the drones, yes. That I'm the evil capitalist in the story. I don't know. I, it, it seems like from the past like year or so, I've become an absolute hater of drones. Really? Yeah, because you go you go on a beach or you go in a park and there's always something you go, and you're just fucking taking pictures and shit. And I'm like, why? Why is this necessary? So if they didn't have any sound, it would be okay. 
The sound is probably the most alarming thing. Yeah. If they didn't, well, if they didn't have a sound, there'd probably be other privacy issues. It would e- it would be even scarier because you yeah. turn around, oh shit, there's like a drone staring at me. But this this mosquito sound that kind of fucks me up mainly. <laughs> I don't know if you if you got the same thing, but when you hear it, you just slightly get edgy and be like, what's in the actual shit? I don't know. <laughs> I'm a technology hater for some reason uh, I'll, I'll go back to stickers and stones at some point it's very bizarre you should be like a pro tech person yeah uh, well i'm what can i say uh i'm a conflicting person speaking of technology yeah uh today we wanted to try and explore a bit um uh, more about ai because in the last six or nine months Everybody's talking about AI. You Six know. to nine months. AI's been around for like ages, decades. It's true. <laughs> but in the last six and nine months, it kind of got into the public sphere with uh, GPT-4 and with uh, Midjourney and, you know, with DALI, etc. So people started actually using those models either as um, image generating uh, tools or as, uh, you know, with the large language models, they started using them for a variety of reasons, not only writing essays, but just like complementing different kinds of uh, jobs. And then people are being um, slightly alarmed about losing their jobs. You know, the whole shtick of, yeah. you know, uh, robots will replace us and kill us. Uh, as your uh, mug says, so many doomsdays, so little time. <laughs> so um, m- my interest is also not only on in the public sphere, but rather in, in the scientific domain, what AI actually means for science. I mean, what kind of stuff can we optimize? What kind of um, processes could be uh, designed because we have AI? And what can we potentially derive from it in terms of productivity, discoveries, etc.? Okay, great. Um, maybe I should give a bit of context about m- where I fit in into AI because I am an astrophysicist yeah. and you're making me talk about AI and people are probably like, what's what? going on? <laughs> um, so surprisingly, um, it has a huge amount to do with astrophysics and science in general. Um, when I was doing my PhD, I, I was already starting to get hyped mm. about AI. And the problem was that we were entering the era of big data in astronomy. Mm. In astronomy, in the past, people would take <coughs> astro photographs on giant plates, and you would have um, individual people examine them mm. plate by plate to find out where a galaxy is, like mark down its coordinates or whatever. Um, so it was a very slow process, and mm. and even now, a lot of astronomy is still done by hand, mm. by eye by some poor student somewhere. (laughs) Please look through these 10,000 images for me. Sounds like slavery. (laughs) Um, But um, yeah, with big data coming in, um, like the Euclid mission that I talked about in my talk yesterday, um, Euclid is going to be taking 100 gigabytes of data every single day, downloading it. Very, like... To download 100 gigabytes of data, I don't know if you've done it, but it's it's a huge amount. It will take you all day just to download. You wouldn't want to know what kind of stuff I download. And then can you imagine like processing through that, like image by image, just flicking through? It's just not feasible. Like yeah. to analyze this amount of data, we need algorithms that can quickly flick through and say, oh, that thing's interesting, that's mm-hmm. unusual, or process all of this data very quickly in a in a manual way for us. So basically, it's uh, mostly used as a filter uh, in, in a way. So it basically filters out stuff that isn't of interest. And it, it can do, to, yes. It identifies specific characteristics of different images. Yes, so they can. can be categorized. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. So um, in my work in particular, uh, one of the first papers that I published was um, actually using simulations of what Euclid would see, hmm. but not working on the galaxies that typically we're interested in. Hmm. Um, in Euclid, in addition to galaxies, it will see a lot of asteroids. Hmm. And asteroids are slow moving on the sky. 
And this ap- makes them appear like um, galaxies hmm. that have been distorted by gravitational lensing. Hmm. So that's what Euclid is looking for, gravitationally lens galaxies and hmm. measuring their shapes. But it will be contaminated by like hundreds or thousands of asteroids. Hmm. Hmm. And so I developed an algorithm to automatically pick out what are asteroids hmm. and what are galaxies so that we could filter those out and they wouldn't contaminate our signal looking for dark matter and dark energy. So basically it cleans them up. Yeah. Cool. That's cool. And how that, uh, how did you get to that algorithm? I mean, what, what kind of skill set? is required for you to make something like this? It's really surprising, actually. As an astronomer, you would think that I just look for a telescope most of the time, but it's very unusual for astronomers to even own a telescope. Um, I went one time to a big telescope in Chile during my PhD, and that's it. Like, mm. And even then, you don't look at it. You go to this giant telescope. You don't even enter the room of the telescope. You're in a separate control room, mm. just looking at graphs and, and yeah. data. You yeah. don't get to see anything at all. Yeah. Um, so I guess a lot of the skills that you develop as an astronomer is data analysis, working with tables of numbers, working mm. with algorithms to process those numbers. And so that's very like similar to mm. working mm. with machine learning, coding algorithms to deal with the data. Um, it's not that different at all. It's basically data science then. It's, so it's basically data science. That's and cool. that's why it's so applicable. Like that's why I always say everyone should do physics or astronomy because mm. all the skills that you develop there can be applicable to a wide variety of things from like data science mm. to, um, I don't know, some a lot of people go into finance and other yeah. things like that. From from dark energy to the dark arts of finance. <laughs> I know. Amazing. Awful. <laughs> so, okay, um, uh, you started with uh, this algorithm that cleans up the images uh, from, um, uh, you know, asteroids, etc. So you get a better idea of the stuff that you're actually analyzing. But what are the different use cases uh, for AI in this? Is it, is it just to fix imaging or is there some kind of other application where you can There is so many applications of AI in mm. astronomy. So um, detecting things is one thing. So mm. detecting new things, detecting things that you already know about. Um, but there's so many different algorithms in machine learning machine learning is such a wide field. You can use it for um, modeling very complex theories in astronomy and physics. Mm. We have very complex theories that typically you'd have to derive mountains and mountains of equations just mm. to make. And a lot of the times those are really hard to program. Um, for, for example, like taking derivatives of um, indefinite <coughs> integrals is an apart possible thing to do hmm. um, but you could simplify you could approximate it with a sh with machine learning algorithms hmm. and and that will um, kind of approximate the models in a, a very easy to handle way because in machine learning a lot of what you're doing is just multiplication and hmm. uh, addition um, over and over and over again so it, it's very simple um, simple math <laughs> so Basically, yeah, when we're talking about uh, theoretical astrophysics, you could potentially model some of the wow theories that you have. So can you model, let's say, um, multiverses? Or can you model uh, some kind of uh, space-time topology, that kind of stuff? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's something um, me with, like there's a big theory group at the University of Nottingham And they're really interested in seeing if we can use machine learning to help them model some of these. Mm -hmm. um, they call them swampland theories, um, mm. which are like bizarre, yeah, like there. string theories yeah. and all sorts of things um, just to help us rule it out. Because machine learning can do that. They can say, here's the data, like you can say, here's the data mm -hmm. and be like, here's the all of the theories that mm -hmm. you can model which theories match the data the best and machine hmm. learning can help you sort through that. But how does that, I mean, um, because I've actually never seen uh, a model that tastes, uh, that tests a universe <laughs> because it's, it's a pretty big thing. I mean, uh, string theory has the potential of influencing everything around us. If, if we know the base reality that we're operating at, 
And that's, I think, a lot of data. So what is the model actually look like? I mean, how can you uh, use some kind of measurements to get them through the filter that would be the verification of string theory, for example? I mean, how is it, uh, I'm gonna uh, give a shitty example. Is it just like a, like a sandbox Minecraft type of thing? Is it just a mathematical model that's uh, very specialized and it needs to be within those error bars? Mm -hmm. Is it something else entirely? Because when we're talking about models, uh, I don't think people can actually imagine what we're talking about. <laughs> it's, yeah. just, it's just a word. Yeah, that's true. They, they are mathematical models. Um, and one thing that I want to mention is that um, there is machine learning algorithms that have been applied to rediscover physics. Hmm. Um, and, and that was like one of the coolest things that I saw is that you can um, just give it the data like of like an object falling right mm. or um some other viscosity measurements mm. of something um and you give it all this data and you give it like um how equations can be structured so you can say mm -hmm. um you can use any constants that you want but you and you can use these op mathematical operations mm. addition multiplication mm -hmm. powers blah 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 and um, there was a study that did this and the machine learning algorithm was able to recreate all the physics mm. that we learned, like cool. that we know and someone discovered, but the machine learning algorithm was able to rediscover it itself mm. without you saying like, these are the rules of physics that you have to follow. They were able to recreate it. And without being trained on a set of uh, formulae, et cetera. Yes, exactly. Okay. They use this kind of, um, they call it an evolution um, algorithm mm -hmm. where um, you would put together different operations mm -hmm. and the operations that get closer to the data, they mm -hmm. go on and kind of breed mm -hmm. new um new sets of equations mm -hmm. that are similar to the first one to get closer and closer to it. True. And the ones that get further away from the data, they kind of eliminate it. So just like evolution of humanity itself, like the best genes are always carried on. That's, um, cool. that's how it works. It's crazy. There was, uh, there was this web app probably like 15 years ago of, of a bike going over uh, spotted terrain and so some of the bikes were horrible and one was with just one wheel and a really small shitty wheel and it would just fall over after like a meter another one would be just too small to go over the big humps etc but after like thousands and thousands of iterations basically the, it got to an equilibrium of an optimal size of wheels and the uh, length between the wheels etc so that kind of a thing is um, yeah exactly that kind of an adaptation cool there was um um i think by wolfram alpha uh they had a project about um mapping uh, physics in a similar way of what you're saying. I'm not sure it was an evolutionary algorithm, but they try to uh, relate the different things that we know about the universe and in a unified model. So basically they wanted to do a unified theory of physics and the interdependency of the different parts of what we know about physics. And it was really interesting. It looked, well, because they, they made a graphical representation, right? Uh, and it looked uh, very, very separate. So there was what we knew about the quantum world and what we knew about the macroscopic and the, the huge Large parts of the universe. Yeah. Yeah. And it was really interesting because it looks like two bulbs that just didn't connect, <laughs> which, which I think is lovely. It would be interesting to see if via AI we could potentially make some connections between what we know of uh, the different worlds. Or maybe it will just create the new theory altogether. Yeah. That, that that unifies the quantum and the large scales. That would be ideal. Yeah. So um, would you say that in um, using huge amounts of data, so uh, for example, with Euclid, obviously you can uh, uh, use celestial data, etc. But this probably a bunch of other use cases of using huge amounts of data and uh, manipulating it with AI. Uh, that's one way in which you can optimize uh, our access to data right now. So for example, there's 
a bunch of uh, earth observation stuff from uh, ESA, for example, that they do with the Sentinel missions, etc. So, uh, is this the way in which we can make better predictions of like weather or some other stuff? What's what's well, your inclination in this? Yeah, weather is like one of the areas where we have the most amount of data. So mm. absolutely, it can. And we're the worst with predicting it. Yeah. yeah, we are the worst at predicting it. It is very chaotic. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I think machine learning is definitely um, going to be the way that people um, is able to analyze huge data sets like that. Mm. Um, and space data, we get so much space data. You know, we have so many satellites up there all the time mm. taking imagery of the Earth constantly. There are endless opportunities to kind of um, make take advantage of this um, data. Mm. Um, one of the projects that I'd been working on with um, the Wrights Lab at the University of Nottingham um, and some uh, master's students um, is detecting slavery from space imagery. Um, slavery from space. Yeah. That's you, you can see it from space. Um, so there are these um, brick kilns in India. Do you know what a brick kiln is? No. So they're kind of places where they they create bricks. Okay. Um, they build them in kilns and they put them under the fire to fire them up. Um, often these bricks will explode and other things during when they create them. Um, and at, in these kilns, the majority of the people that work there, like over 90% are like in slavery conditions. Uh -huh. They're held there against their will. Um, in contracts that they can't escape, they're not paid. Um, a lot of them are children, like under 10 years old. Um, so it's pretty crazy. What But the fuck? I know. And they're all over India. There's so many of them. But it's a huge you, industry. Yeah, but, but how do you, I mean, obviously you, you don't have like a resolution of, let's say, 10 centimeters. So we can, you know, track the life of somebody so how, how do you extrapolate that a group of people are under slavery conditions i mean yeah. what, what are the presumptions that you do in order to state this so the first thing is to identify where these kilns are because they pop up all the time people are always building them because they're huge sources of money mm. um so we need to figure out where they are And they typically have very distinguished shapes that you can see in satellite imagery. Mm. If they're active, you'll see smoke coming out of the chimneys as well. Um, the problem is that a lot of our space data does not have the resolution mm. to distinguish it. There, there's uh, some high resolution data, but there's not much of it there. And traditionally, um, what people have done is have, have to go image by image seeing by eye, oh, that looks like a brick kiln. Mm. There's some smoke in this high resolution data. And so what I've been working on with the Wrights Lab is seeing if we can do some low resolution mapping mm. using AI to enhance super resolution of these low resolution images, mm. which mm. we have all sky coverage of. Um, so very pixelated data yeah. you make it high resolution and then using also the machine learning algorithm to pick out that's a kiln with x amount of probability that's like uh, csi you know keep zooming and enhancing yeah basically. yeah and it, it it's insane like we can get several orders of scale improvement um <laughs> using machine learning but how, using ai how do you improve the quality of an image because obviously the the, the input is with X amount of bytes. So uh, what you improve is, is it just some kind of a, uh, like a, a image regression type of thing? And does it, does it uh, work in a similar way like DALI or mid journey type of thing? I mean, how does the improvement of the image actually happen? The improvement of the image is usually use, using um, convolutional methods. And so you have this like kernel that looks for specific shapes and mm. is able to enhance that um, based on that. We know what kilns look like. So you do map it and you, you see like high resolution image would produce this low resolution image. Mm -hmm. um, there's also the fact that between pixels, you'll be sharing a lot of information. Um, 
because it's kind of like spread out over several mm -hmm. pixels. So there'll be correlation between different pixels. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that the machine learning is to do is trying to pull out that correlation in, mm -hmm. I, in order to get this higher resolution. And it is possible to do. Um, it's not necessarily 100% correct, but um, it's it will give you the most likely result. Mm. Um, uh, and and that's often good enough. So basically, the, in this way, you can identify in low resolution with different degrees of probability the potential location of these places. And then you could, let's say, verify if you have access to high quality data, you could potentially verify this yeah, uh, absolutely. just on those specific places, not everywhere. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And so once we've done that, um, that information would go to an entity like the UN who mm. would send people into those kilns specifically to to investigate on mm. any any of these workers in slavery conditions and putting a stop to it. I was wondering uh, that given that there's different kinds of uh, detective uh, instruments, uh, let's say you have one kind of camera that's kind of shit and doesn't see very well the kiln or whatever. Um, but then there's another one, it's it's also low resolution, but in a different way. Uh, is there some kind of a characteristic in the way that it smudges things? Let's say uh, this, um, the relationship between the pixels that you said. Yes, I mean, th absolutely. Does it yeah. work different in different ways with different cameras and yeah. different characteristics? In, different in principle, you could have like lots of different low resolution cameras and get mm -hmm. a really good high resolution image mm -hmm. because also you're imaging it slightly off right mm -hmm. so you if you were able to extract those characteristics mm -hmm. kind of collate them all together you would get a, a a much you get a lot of information in there cool yeah cool so you remove a lot of the camera effects as well like pixelization effects like any like um i, I don't know noise in the camera mm. you would remove that because they would be slightly different in each of the different cameras so basically you can make a model that's optimized for, let's say, Laker. Uh, so you can basically make better pictures out of that one in particular. And if you combine them with different kinds of cameras, maybe they have different faults mm. so they can optimize each other. Yeah. That kind of a thing. Yeah. That's cool. So um, we're kind of focused on imaging with uh, the whole thing, both with Euclid and with um, uh, the example right now with the kilns and with uh, Earth observation. But there's some pretty big hype with people talking about entirely new discoveries. Um, some of the, I guess, uh, good uh, examples are to do with uh, biology and medicine. So, you know, there's uh, the promise of potentially finding new uh, molecules that have specific uh, characteristics that could be of use in medicine. Uh, maybe there could be some different kinds of ways that we can manipulate uh, um, biological molecules, etc. So, do you have um, any, um, any, let's say, uh, input into how that could work potentially? Does this relate to your field in physics? Do you have that kind of an example probably with particles, virtual particles, that kind of a thing? Um, in, in astronomy, actually, there's so many cases like that, I guess. Um, in general, l like I said earlier, we work with so much data. Mm. It's like working in multi-dimensional space, right? And typically it's very hard to pick out by eye to see that these things, that there's something special going on mm. here, especially, um, well, I'm gonna go back to the simple case of visually, um, mm. spiral galaxies and elliptical galaxies, they're very easy to distinguish by mm. eye, but actually we know that there's many more kind of, um, morphologies of galaxies than just spiral and ellipticals oh, yeah. there's irregulars and there's there's all sorts of different disc shapes and and like um core shapes of galaxies mm. um they're all very very different mm. Mm. um we can extract a lot of information from galaxies like their chemical abundances so what they're made out of um i don't know how many spiral arms they have or like mm. how uh, extended they are so if you collected all of this data would you be able to put them into different categories mm. 
there there are literally like an infinite number of characteristics that you could yeah. describe a galaxy by but if we were to go through that for every single galaxy, I said Euclid's going to detect 1.5 billion galaxies, right? So That's we're not going to go through each <laughs> billion galaxy and think, oh, wait, this one stands out from all these million characteristics that we've looked at. No, mm. that's that's where machine learning will come in. It can easily process like huge dimensionalities of data mm. and see that this is an outlier. This mm. is special. This is something that a human should look into more. But that's more in the line of categorization still, right? So um, in, in this sense, you basically figure out more about the world that you see. Uh, my point is... But you would be discovering something new. Maybe it's not a galaxy at uh -huh. all. Maybe it's some. Maybe it's an alien spacecraft or something wow. insane. We really <laughs> rapidly went there. <laughs> okay, so there's uh, some... Um, once you know what kind of characteristics the known objects that you have, you could potentially um, be able to see new kinds of new objects. New discoveries, yeah. Oh, yeah. Huh. Has this happened so far? Um, it has. Um, th there's this thing called um, Zooniverse, which is kind of like this... Um, uh, Zooniverse. Yeah, it's it's crowdsourcing the general public to help analyze the data. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a, a, a intermediary step between scientists doing all of the work and machine learning being able to process very quickly all of it. Um, in between that step, some scientists decided, okay, we can't do all of this work ourselves. We need to get the power of the public to help us. Hmm. And so Zooniverse set up this big project where like anyone, like anyone like listening at home at the moment, they could go hmm. through astronomical data and mark out, oh, this object's interesting. And uh -huh. they've made really interesting discoveries like hmm. mergers of galaxies and special galaxies. Um, from this mm. but again it's still done by humans it's still a really slow process <laughs> yeah we're slow people but <laughs> um, can we let's say that there could be some kinds of processes in the universe that are really fucking unlikely i mean they are probable that just the probability is one in 10 billion whatever so uh when we're talking about those really really unlikely cases and getting astronomical data of it would be um again a, a case of chance yeah. mostly can those uh really unlikely occurrences be modeled in the same way that uh, let's say proving a theorem or whatever could be modeled um uh, let, let's say some kind of a white dwarf merger or just you know a magnetar going to a black hole type of thing is this something that could be modelable um i i think people would see it first realize that it doesn't fit any of the models that we currently have mm -hmm. and that would motivate new models to be created and that's mm. typically how science works like if we've seen something that doesn't mm. fit then it gives rise to all sorts of opportunities for new mm. things and new theories. Yeah, but I mean, in this case, we know that, let's say the two objects exist, just yeah. that that interaction is probably not gonna happen within our lifetime, so the lifetime of humanity. Yeah. You know, just magnetars colliding, they're just really rare. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, could those be... Um, but people would model that already, like even yeah. really rare things, like scientists will, will model everything just yeah. for the sake of modeling them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Interesting. It's, I always uh, hung up on the point of uh, modeling stuff. I just can't imagine how the model would actually look like. I mean, obviously it's not a, they don't make an interstellar type of uh, movie out of it, but it, you know, that's, <laughs> some kind of information that they derive from, let's say, a simulated interaction with this. I just can't imagine how it looks like. I don't know. <laughs> um, we tend to send a lot of stuff into space right now. So anything from the James Webb Space Telescope to 
um, you know, uh, SpaceX's uh, shitty small... Uh, Starlink satellites. Starlink satellites, exactly. They're not the only ones as well. There's yeah. so many more coming. It's going to be horrific. Yeah, for astronomers, that's probably not amazing news. But my point is... Well, uh, even for you guys, right? The yeah. more space junk that you have up there, the more likely it's going to crash into each other and create an yeah. escalade of destruction. Yeah, just cleaning up low Earth uh, orbit is probably going to be a, a a thing in the next uh, several decades. But my point is, when we get all of this stuff outside of the atmosphere, basically the the further away it is, the more autonomous it needs to be. So obviously, when it's kind of close by, you could have some amount of control. Although, as you said, it's probably unlikely because they're too small and there's going to be some kind of issues. But the further you go you need to be able to have some kind of AI actually operating this whole thing. Let's say you uh, do a research mission on the icy moons of uh, Jupiter or something else, or just send something to Venus, you want to explore below the clouds, odds are you will not have direct control, right? Yeah, absolutely. So um, what kind of what kind of a set of uh, software will be developed in order to manage these? Because as we know, let's say the Apollo missions, they weren't huge on software. I mean, you could you could literally see the software for the Apollo missions on a bunch of uh, textbooks. Yeah. Uh, and at the same time right now, we're working with a lot of data and with incredibly complex algorithms. Do you think that We'll be using stuff that uh, manages robotics, etc., more to do with AI, or are we going to stick to something that's more lean and precise, you know, more straightforward stuff? Because, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, AI that we're using right now, it's um, better with working with more messy stuff, but it's not necessarily better at getting results that are concrete. I think. Um... So um, even like rovers on Mars at the moment, they mm -hmm. use AI, right? Mm. Because if you were to talk to your robot on Mars, mm. it's a six to 20 minute delay. So yeah. let's say your ro rover is driving and it sees a cliff and it tells you, oh, I see a cliff. Mm. It takes 20 minutes to go back to the Earth. Earth yeah. says, you should stop yeah. <laughs> 20 minutes to get back. It's 40 minutes past, yeah. it's already driven off the cliff and died. Yeah. Um, so you need the autonomous, autonomous um, vehicles here mm. to make its own decisions. Is this cliff high? How high is it? Would mm. I damn it? Should I stop? You need these kind of things. Mm. But it's also hard to train. So machine learning, you need to train the algorithms in mm. some way. You need to teach it like how to think it, mm, it can't just mm, it doesn't magically mm. think up stuff you have to give it examples and and say mm. um this is what you should do or um, let it decide what it, it should do and give mm. it rewards in, if it does it correctly yeah. um this kind of thing so you need to train it the problem with space is that we don't have that data to train it with when mm. we send new rovers to space we don't send it to somewhere that it's been before we send mm. it to places that it hasn't been before because that's where the new scientific discoveries are um and i don't know if you remember um a, a couple of weeks ago there was a lander mission by the japanese uh, private space company called ispace and they attempted to land this rover on the moon mm. And it was great. There's a couple of minute d delay with communication. So it's it's autonomous um, to detect when to eject its fuel um, and start slowing down for mm. touchdown. Um, they train the algorithm on simulations. Mm. The simulations didn't take into account the rim of the crater. Hmm. And so it saw the rim of a crater and thought it was already at the bottom already. So it just kind of plummeted. Yeah, um, that's unfortunate. Yeah. The good thing is that it's all software issues, right? They can't easily implement that into their simulations, yeah. but it's getting that correct in the first place, being yeah. able to have realistic training data for your algorithms to learn on is the hard thing. Oh, we're just going to build a bunch of stuff, get it destroyed, and then we'll learn from the mistakes. 
Yeah, infinite money. Yes. <laughs> yeah, thank God for capitalism. Um, <laughs> I'm just saying. Uh, so when we're working with uh, this amount of uh, crazy amount of data uh, from astrophysics or from um, Earth observation or whatever, or biology, there's always the case of um, which of that data is not only readily available, but should be used. So um, there is a bunch of uh, talk right now about uh, privacy, about uh, utilizing um, data to predict stuff. So um, in the EU, obviously we have GDPR and that kind of uh, um, boundaries on, on personal data. But technically, the better we get at predicting stuff uh, from... Um, let's say, uh, second order type of data. So, for example, you go uh, with a low resolution satellite, you pick out the kilns or whatever. But technically, you can derive a lot more information out of this and plus technology will be improving. So the boundary between what kind of data is personal and what kind of data is readily available and could be um, non-anonymized, uh, is kind of getting murky. So uh, once you have a really good algorithm of predicting stuff based on the after effects of Maggie Lou, for example, <laughs> you know, you're walking down the street, but at some point we will be able to infer that you've been there just not by having pictures of you or videos of you, etc. But we know from the small feet that left those uh, footsteps on the mud over there, or we we'll know by um, the spent in the local cafe, cafe that matches your uh, pattern of shopping or whatever that given that uh, we can relate those kinds of uh, data points together to get the picture of you, um, we, we can see this with social media right now, and it's again more direct there, but it will get more convoluted with time. How should we approach this? But because we're, uh, we're going into an informational age of unprecedented uh, uh, characteristics, and it doesn't seem obvious that we will just say, wow, we'll just ban it. So we'll just make people not use that data because it doesn't seem to work that way. I mean, if you have a good enough algorithm, you'll be able to predict stuff based on really shitty data, as you yeah. said, pixelated images of kilns, for example. Sure. I think the big problem at the moment that people are worried about is not getting compensated for their data that they're sharing. Hmm. I think a lot of people, um, for the things that you mentioned, like mid journey uh, hmm. for image creation before, that's scouring the internet for other people's images to create new hmm. images. And, and the artists feel like that this is going to be putting them out of jobs, right? Mm -hmm. Because they can create similar or even better images that they themselves can create do it on a much shorter time scale. Mm. There are, are no need for artists anymore. So people are scared, mm -hmm. right? Um, and they don't feel like they're, they're compensated for it. But at the same time, like that, all of their data that they've shared is public, right? So um, I could go online. If I was a great artist, I'd be able to copy their style and create mm. my own thing. And they wouldn't expect me to recompensate them for mm. drawing in a specific style. I mean, like in school, you would, in art classes, you would quite often be told, I'll oh, draw in this style mm. or this artist style. And that's always been okay. But as soon as it's came on to kind of the AI revolution, mm. where it may be that this object or this algorithm could take my job, Mm. it becomes more scary for people. Now you can so see they're why. more defensive, yeah. right? But I think this is the way we have to move forward. Like, I, I think that, yes, there will be a lot of people impacted by mm. the revolution of AI, but then new jobs will come. There will be more engineers working on mm. AI, further AI algorithms, cleaning the data to mm. train algorithms. There's going to be... It's, it's going to change life as we know it. 
and make it better so we can focus on more important jobs. Hmm. But that's more to do with the um, with with the problem of you know job loss and optimization of processes. I mean, I'd argue that artists are not only going to be not out of a job, but probably have way more jobs. <laughs> but um, my my main point in in this was more to do with privacy, privacy. and control, because imagine. Um, you're an enlightened dictator, Maggie. You're a dictator that will take over the world at some point. Um, the way that you probably be able to do it in the next few decades is by using some kind of AI technology, right? So you, you'll be able to um, manage to identify dissent uh, within your domain with, uh, you know, with working with different kinds of AI to detect uh, different kinds of messages, tones, etc. You can be uh, able to detect different kinds of gatherings with space images, etc. You see, oh, there's more than three people in that corner every Thursday. Okay, so no gatherings in my domain. Um, <laughs> you, you see what I'm getting at? So basically, the more uh, the more options that you have to apply control with uh, infinite amount of data, and it doesn't have to be direct uh, data, it doesn't have to be a photo of people talking together, it could be just inference. Uh, doesn't that just remove some amount of the guardrails of democracy? Doesn't that actually create some kind of issues if you want to have some freedom of expression, freedom of movement? Um, because end of the day, this would be accessible. You, you think all this data would be accessible? Well, I mean, right now we can see that uh, we don't have a good model for um, actually being able to say this is private data and, and this is public data. I mean, you yourself can just literally put uh, a microphone in that garden over there uh, on one side and another one on the other side. And based on the soundscape of the whole thing, you get a pretty good idea of how many people pass by there, uh, what are the characteristics of them, how many are children, how many are uh, dogs, etc. So uh, is that uh, data uh, collection regulated? Not very well. I mean, is it not? So in the UK, like even if you have like a home security system, mm -hmm. like a camera, if that is shown on the street, you have to register it mm -hmm. as CCTV. You can't just set up a camera. If it's stationary, but you have a phone. Sure. Uh, my point is, um, yeah, we, we have some amount of guardrails for things that we know. So a CCTV is a very specific thing because you're recording pictures of people in that particular spot right now. Yeah. But my point is, yeah, that's kind of on the stuff that we've kind of figured out. We're figuring it out for drones as well, kind of, you know, we're trying yeah. to make uh, places that are drone free, etc. But again, uh, when we're talking about really... Um, like delving into all of the social media data, like every image uploaded, every video uploaded, and trying kind of, to figure yeah. it all out. Or just imagine you have some uh, public access data. Let's say the city has some amount of uh, Internet of Things detectors for stuff, for heat, for humidity, for whatever. Um, you know, my, my argument is that the better we are at designing uh, algorithms, the less data, the less concrete data we'll need to be able to predict stuff. We wouldn't, wouldn't need CCTV. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't need a specific uh, kind of set of data from social media. We'll be able to derive this from second order data, right. which are uh, more uncertain, but still would do the job. Right. But, yeah. Yeah. I never really thought of it like that, but that is a scary thought. Thank you. That Thank is a you. frightening thought. Thank you. That's uh, that's what I'm thinking about every night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, um, I think the way that um, is useful to think about new technologies is in a, in kind of a black mirror way. In order <laughs> to, you know, you need to be able to. Uh, forecast the ethical issues, not when they've actually occurred. <laughs> you need to be able to preempt this with uh, legislation in some shape or form. Because 
uh, otherwise you, you're just in a dystopia without noticing basically maybe but then if you're too careful what it like some of these things it feels like it's it's not going to happen hmm. and you're putting all these guardrails up for no reason because it's possible yeah yeah true yeah, yeah it, it is possible but then again i mean you don't know what the next uh, uh, nuclear revolution is going to be like and mm -hmm. ai seems like the kind of force multiplier that could potentially make life pretty fucking shit or amazing but you don't know where the pendulum will swing <laughs> right right so i think being conservative um to some degree maybe isn't a bad idea so for example in the last uh, six months there were some you know uh, letters of uh, slowing down ai development yeah. etc uh isn't that some kind of a tool that you can uh, utilize because in humanity scale uh, type of thing, whether we do it in two years, five years, or 10 years, it doesn't fucking matter uh, that much. So wouldn't you say that being a bit cautious would probably serve some kind of a tool, or do you think the benefits of having it now, today, outweigh the risk? I definitely think the benefits outweigh the risks. Mm -hmm. I think the risks are really over-exaggerated because I'm, I use AI in my research day to day and mm. I know how unimpressive it actually is. <laughs> like you have to really, really process the data, really like get it specific even to make it do what you mm. want to do. And then even then there are ways to break it very easily. Mm. Um, there are like in my detection algorithms, for example, of asteroids, you could change one pixel mm -hmm. in the image and already the machine learning algorithm would get it wrong because cool. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah. It, they're so easy to break. Yeah. And I think that's the same with like a lot of the models that we're seeing. People mm. think they're all magic, but mm. actually they're very deterministic and and it's not going to kind of be taking over the world anytime soon. Yeah. yeah. Um, Give it a few months. But I think also people don't understand them very well. So yeah. that puts them more on the cautious side. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, I, I can I can confirm that basically whenever we talk with um, AI specialists, they're always like, in, that thing's taking over the world? No fucking way. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that that's just, it can't uh, differentiate between a chihuahua and a muffin. Yes, <laughs> so absolutely. Uh, yeah. I've shown that in all, many of my t lectures as well, like... Uh, yeah, chihuahua and muffin detection. Yeah, the, the infamous uh, muffin detection. So um, if we have to uh, wrap this up with a, with a positive spin, because I always uh, add the, the darker side of uh, AI somewhere before the, before the end. Um, what, are, according to uh, your forecasts, uh, what are the most interesting potential use cases for AI in the not so necessary near future uh, because you know the limitations of uh, AI right now etc but what would be the best case scenario for either in your field or in general that you think would be um, tapping some kind of huge productivity or some huge kind of discoveries etc via AI what, what would AI be able to enable that we just wouldn't be able to figure out on our own so um, actually today on Twitter, I already saw there was like a study on um, how Stack Overflow, do you know what Stack yeah. Overflow is for coding questions and stuff like that? Mm -hmm. The number of users has dropped significantly since ChatGPT and since mm -hmm. uh, a GitHub co-pilot. Yeah. And so people are relying more on these large language models to help them code. Mm -hmm. And I think this is going to be hugely game-changing in our mm -hmm. area. Um rather than spending huge amounts of time searching for answers for mm. specific ways to code a, a certain piece, you can mm -hmm. do it quite quickly um, with AI. So I think this will boost productivity. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, have you got ChatGPT4? Yeah. Yeah. I have it right now, I, in I, fact. All the questions <laughs> that I'm asking you right now are from GPT4. Oh. Yeah. 
cheat. I know. <laughs> no wonder this sounded like a robot conversation. <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, it's um, also my voice. So. But it's really great that you can add all of these enhanced chat GPT with these add-ons. And so there's like Scholar AI that I would use or easily help me find like the most um, interesting papers that mm. is related to the work I'm doing currently, give mm. it a summary rather than me searching on the web, going through mm. hundreds of papers. I just have it there. Mm. It will just increase our efficiency enormously mm. so we can focus on actually doing the research. Mm. Um, for the general public, I also think this is a huge game changer on getting people to the same level. Um, one thing that we have at the university at the moment is this huge thing about students using ChatGPT to cheat, potentially, mm. um, writing their essays for them, writing their like exam questions or whatever. But actually, it's I don't see it particularly as cheating if they are using it just to um, kind of enhance what they're already writing. Um, I don't know about you, but in school, like um, my parents don't speak much English. So they've mm. never helped me with like any like um, essay or anything like mm. that. Mm. Um, but a lot of other people, they might have academic parents or or quite clever like friends and family that will look over their essays for them mm. and help them improve their English and stuff. Yeah. Um, Seventy percent of my students are international students, mm. and a lot of them, their English isn't great. Mm. And already, that will set them a bar lower than the native English speakers. Mm. So, if you can introduce a tool like this, that will help the students that are less comfortable around language. Remember, I'm a astronomy course. I'm a machine learning course, right? Mm. I'm not an English course. Yeah. So the benefits that they're getting out of ChatGPT is not the knowledge, but it's the kind of mm. communication. And so this will help immensely getting those international students or people from um, lower privileged backgrounds to the same level that um, priv privileged English speakers have. So basically you think that uh, if I have to categorize this as an AI, uh, the main sources of improvement are actually going to be really practical. They're going to be in terms of programming and optimization of productivity there. They're going to be in education as tools to level the playing field. Uh, and basically they're going to be in stuff that just makes us better with AI as a partner tool yes. rather than something really out there. So you don't think that AI is going to change something fundamentally in a domain that doesn't exist right now. So mm -hmm. it's, it's not like we're going to have a new science that just uh, generates stuff via AI. You think the practical thing is probably the most game changing for you? Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Maggie, thanks for, thanks for coming to Bulgaria again. Thank it you was for really having lovely. me. <laughs> so fun. Yeah, I hope uh, I hope we'll be able to do something soon again. I think uh, you will learn to love the yogurt soup character <laughs> at some point, which is not a breakfast, <laughs> as as I've pointed out numerous times over the last two days. And uh, yeah, I'd love to I'd love to chat more about space at some point. So you're always welcome. Thank you.